welcome to Sketch Fabulous. Thank you so much for uh, joining us as we explore the 3D models in the Acklands collection. My name is Lindsay Hale. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the museum. And today I am joined by... Uh, Joel Vanderkamp. I'm the, and what is your role at the museum, Joel? I am the lead preparator at the Ackland. Um, a preparator at the Ackland, um, well, preparators typically they're the ones who handle and move the collection and install the exhibits. At, at the Ackland, uh, we're a relatively small, small museum, so a lot of what I do is fabrication. I do a lot of uh, construction of uh, pedestals, mounts, exhibition furniture. That's awesome. So when we come into the museum, we have you and your team to thank for uh, letting us be able to see the objects in, you know, great light and proper cases. So yeah, you help make the magic happen. Um, so awesome. All right, so we are going to talk today about the 3D models that live on Sketchfab, hence the name Sketch Fabulous. Um, I'm going to ask Joel a few questions about the design process as he is very hands-on from day one. Then we're going to go visit the Sketchfab site, which is free and open to the public. You don't need any sort of login um, to search for the Ackland's 3D models. And then we'll finish up with just sharing a few ideas on ways you can incorporate these 3D models into your family um, learning. And then we'll have a brief period at the end for Q&A, which you can ask in the chat at any time. And we'll check that at the end of the session. All right. So at the museum, we're fortunate enough to have 19, over 19,000 works of art in our collection. And that means we can't display them all at the same time. So we wanted to share some models that we have on Sketchfab that lets you examine some of the smaller works in our collection. And so with that, Joel, how did the 3D modeling project start at the Acklin? Uh, well, a few years ago, uh, we were um, uh, exploring 3D printing and seeing what we could do with that uh, for display options and um, started making 3D printed mounts. And um, it became uh, apparent, well, so when you make a 3D printed mount, uh, the first thing you have to do is make a, 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 a virtual model of the object you're making a mount for. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point in that, in that process, we realized that while the mounts were interesting and, and um, uh, useful, that the models that we were making uh, for the mounts uh, were were pretty useful in and of themselves. Um, it, there would seem to be a lot of implications uh, for conservation purposes, um, other types of mounts. We were thinking primarily of display, but you can uh, print mounts or route mounts for storage uh, and travel. And then of course, it, it's a great way once we discovered, um, I've been collaborating with uh, 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 Kelly Chandrapal in, um, in our education department and, and, and she keyed in on Sketchfab and we realized, oh, that we can really make these models uh, more broadly accessible um, and, and therefore make the collection more accessible as well. No, that's, that's great. And it's always wonderful to find um, technology that has multiple benefits uh, to the museum, whether it's, uh, you know, someone exploring from home, um, in exhibition prep, definitely. So along that line, how did you select which pieces um, or you and Kelly select collaboratively to, to put online? Right, right. So um, the, the, the way that we're making our models is a, is a process called photogrammetry. There's different ways that you can do it. You can, you can scan the object, um, uh, but we we are doing a um, a process that involves taking a lot of photographs of the object and then processing those images uh, through a, a piece of software. And um, some objects work better in this in the photogrammetry process than others. And so largely, um, we chose objects that would that we knew would be uh, that would create the least amount of hurdles to success at the outset. 
Um, and, and then we have explored um, things that were more challenging as we go. But, but uh, to give you a sense, things that are um, uh, matte in appearance, so not reflective, work better. Um, things that, have, that are textured tend to work better too. Um, and uh, uh, things that are, uh, say, a solid object is, is, is easier to work with than something that is a, a hollow object in some way, though there's some workarounds for that too. Okay, um, yeah. And we also, um, we've tried to be mindful too as we go. Um, we have a lot of different objects that have the potential to be successful. So um, we, we've also tried to draw from different areas of the collection as we go. No, that, that, that's great, 100%. Um, and so kind of what you're saying, like a glass object wouldn't necessarily work well or not all porcelain or pottery in our collection maybe would yeah. like it. Yeah, or something that is um, it's, uh, monochromatic doesn't tend to work as well. So if you have a pot that is, is matte in finish, but it's like, all of one color. Sometimes it, it's hard for the, the program to read the depth um, on that object in some ways, but um, yeah. Awesome. So how long with all of the photogametry, um, how long does the process of rendering tend to take and, and what steps are involved from start to finish? Right, okay. So um, we would take an object, say um, something like this, this drinking cup here, and um, we would, uh, uh, photograph it from above and rotate the object on a, on a Lazy Susan um, and then we would move the camera down and maybe take a shot from the middle or the middle upper and, and we'd do that again and we'd probably take 25 or 30 photographs. Um, this wouldn't be a, a great object to be to be shooting by the way but uh, and then and then at the end we would flip the object over and, and continue that with something like this which is a pretty basic form we will probably take about 75 to 80 photographs. Um, there's, I have an object that I'm working on right now that's, um, it's, a, it's a much more, um, it's, a, it's a more, it's a flat form and it has a lot more details. And I, I took um, about 250 to 300 photographs for that one. And then the next step would be to, you, you would upload those into the, whatever program you're working with and you would uh, mask out all the background so that what the program would see would just be the object itself. And that's probably the most time consuming part is going through and cutting out the object um, anywhere from 80 to a few hundred times. Um, and then from there you would run various iterations of the, of the program until it built. Uh, the first thing it does is it, it looks for um, common uh, points on the object in each one of the photographs and it builds what's called a sparse point cloud so that after you've run the program once you end up with a sort of a um, almost like a, a fuzzy cloud version of the object and then you you run the through the program a couple more a couple more iterations and eventually it builds a, a an elaborate architecture or a mesh of the object and then it takes all those those photographs and it stitches them together and creates a texture, what it's called a texture. It's kind of a skin that it then wraps around that architecture. Um, and then there's a bunch of post-production things that you can do to it too. It, it, I, we do it um, pretty piecemeal. Um, so we'll do the photography one day and that'll take a couple hours and then we'll spend, you know, maybe, you know, 20 minutes, if you've got 20 minutes here or there, just doing some masking and so it, for us, it ends up taking a few weeks to build a single model, but that's just because we're doing a lot of other things as well. Um, if you dedicated yourself to it, I mean, you can you could punch out a model in, in probably less than a work day, depending on the object. Some things obviously take longer than others. Wow, yeah, no, that, it, it sounds like, um, especially with your role at the museum, it's kind of nice to be able to transition between, you know, maybe some of the, the heavier, you know, the heavier chunks and then these smaller, smaller projects um, that can be done at your own pace. That's really cool to learn about all the steps and, and I just, it's, it, when you were describing it, it made me think it was almost like, a, kind of like reconstructing, like a puzzle in a way, um, about how to make all those connections and the pieces fit together. And so with that, what's been your favorite model that you have put together that's on Sketchfab? 
was there one that just you loved the object or it was super easy to do or <laughs> there's a special story that went along with it yeah yeah uh well there's um we have a limited amount on there right now and and some models we're still working on but i think that there's there's uh there's an african uh ritual vessel that i i i chose i think i chose that object early on because it it met a lot of the criteria for success um and um for, for what i what i thought would be a, a ultimately a successful model um i think i really just like the form too it always interested me it used to be on view and and, and then and then it came off you and i would see it in the in the uh vaults occasionally and it I was always sort of drawn to it, and um, uh, so I, th I th think that was why I had chosen that. Oh, I think too, I was exploring that when I was still thinking about the mounts as well. It, it's an interesting one for uh, it doesn't have it doesn't want to it doesn't have a natural way of sitting. It wasn't meant to be displayed. That's not what the object was for, and I think it was for burying actually ultimately. And and um, so when you display it you have to be very clever in the way that you mount it. And so I thought, oh, that'd be a, a really good candidate um, for, for this process, so. A little bit of a challenge. Well, let's go look at it. Um, okay. So I'm gonna screen share now um, and go into Sketchfab. And then, all right. Can you see that, Joel? I can. Perfect. So yeah, this is Sketchfab's really neat. You can scroll, turn around, go in and out. And I can definitely see the, the textures you were talking about, how it has different points and on all four sides almost. There's no way it could go flush against something. Yeah, it's um it, and this one, I probably I think if I was to do it again, I did this one a while ago. I and it and I'm still very much at the beginning of the my the learning curve on this process um it, it has a lot of texture and i think i would probably give more consideration to the amount of photographs i took there's some detail that is lost as you zoom in um but but overall it it i think it, it reads it reads fairly accurately for the object um some you know objects like this are in particular are good this one has a, what's called a very it's a sort of a friable surface it's a very delicate surface it has coloring on it and organic material that if it's handled a lot that mm -hmm. you'll lose that so it doesn't it wouldn't travel particularly well um and you, you don't want to spend a whole lot of time building a mount for it because you're gonna you're gonna over time you're gonna lose parts of it so uh, that's one of the real benefits of this process is that you can uh virtually display the object, handle it as much as you like in, in the virtual format, and the actual object never deteriorates. No, absolutely. That, that too, actually, is one of the sort of the, uh, the real benefits to this process. Um, as a, somebody who's a registrar or a conservator in the museum, they spend a fair amount of time doing condition reports for objects and, and sort of noting the health of the object, if you will. And this is a really good process for establishing like a baseline uh if you get a good accurate model of this object that's something that you'll be able to compare against for you know years and years to come especially for something like this that's going to have a you know potentially has a changing surface yeah absolutely i can see some of some of there's some reddish tints as well and and yeah there's definitely a lot of detail that that we can see and it's really nice because when this was maybe displayed, maybe the 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 view, the angles that visitors maybe that it wasn't as unobstructed as this in a way. Even though you, I know you mentioned there are some um, limitations to the renderings based on number of photographs and other factors as well. Um, but yeah, these these are really cool. So this is one. Uh, we have a few others. Um, yeah. Do you have we, time to select another one? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I think that's a really good point. There's, a, it also, it does, it gives viewers the opportunity to see things that they otherwise wouldn't get to see. I mean, when you have the object in the space, a lot of times you're, you're limited as to how much you can see. Maybe it's in a case against a wall or um, clearly it's gonna sit on one side or another, but this, this gives viewers an opportunity to, to see more of the object. 
This one has um, annotations on it. This is a, so um, Kelly in education, who I mentioned earlier, she's been um, really fantastic in the work that she's done on Sketchfab. She's, this is, for the most part, I've just done a lot of the model building. Kelly has been doing um, a lot of the, the Sketchfab platform work. And um, so you can see there, one of the, the benefits to the program is that you can add these annotations and you, you, you lock them into a certain part of the model and then you can add um, detail and uh, uh, biographical and uh, historical information uh, to the object. Yeah, this is this is excellent, especially from someone who who really wants to get up close in particular. And I love how the annotations also have, um, you know, like the category names, a little bit of everything talking about what it's made of, what its purpose was, what can we tell about the object, um, who might have owned it or who might have used it. So this is definitely a great, a great learning tool. And um, one thing I, I learned from exploring Sketchfab, there are also other museums on this website uh, besides the Ackland who have also done 3D renderings um, of their collections. So that's also a great way to compare um, and contrast. Uh, you could also, we have a couple, we have a few um, ritual healing vessels that you could compare and contrast, see what's similar, see what's different. Um, and a few other pieces that have different functions as well, because art, you know, is not always purely decorative. It oftentimes, um, especially when we're talking about, you know, some of the more ancient art, uh, they had a function as well. So that's another way to have a great introduction um, into this. So very easy to use. And we have, of course, the um, credit line attached as well. You can also search these images in our uh, collection database on our website, but these, I really like that it gives you that up close and personal feel um, and, and lets you kind of have a moment with the piece to learn more about it. Yeah. So, awesome. Yeah, well, I just um, would underline what you said about the, um, Sketchfab has a really good, um, they're, they're very good at supporting cultural institutions. Um, the um, Minneapolis Institute of Art has a fantastic uh, Sketchfab presence and they make really wonderful models. I, um, I think that um, the, the archaeology department at UNC has a presence on Sketchfab as well and theirs are fantastic and they have hundreds, maybe thousands of models now. In fact, um, Steve Davis over there uh, at the archaeology department was really, um, he was really helpful and supportive of, of the process that Kelly and I have been trying to do here. Um, oh, so that's, if, that's if viewers have a chance, definitely go visit um, some of the other, the other folks um, who, who are making things on here too. Definitely. And we did have one question um, from an attendee. As the museum moves forward, how will we determine what collection items to model next? Uh, what will be the priorities? Yeah, that's a good question. That's, so we're, um, Kelly and I are part of a working group right now that are um, kind of taking the work that we've already done um, and understanding how it fits into the sort of um, broader priorities of the museum. And then um, we're gonna try to, as, as a group, determine the course that we'll, we'll take going forward and, and what shape that'll take. Um, I think likely um, because we are serving the um, university and other educational um, institutions, um, I think thinking about ways in which um, university classes uh, can utilize it, that, that will probably uh, drive uh, uh, some of what we do. Um, I think part of it will be uh, based on the priorities of our collection. Um, what areas are important for us to um, uh, think about in terms of conservation needs um, or, or things that we want to give um, more of a, a presence to that, that otherwise can't. Definitely. Um, um, I know I would like, like uh, we had, what was it? One of the newer Islamic art acquisitions, um, the screen. That would, I know it's oh, big, yeah. so we might not, that might not lend itself well, but it, I wish it would. And oh, along yeah, that, yeah. I, th I think that um, would. What is the largest size that you think you could, uh, like largest size object? Because you know these 
these objects are a little bit on the, the smaller, like, you know, more portable size. Um, right. Could we do something as large as, you know, the screen that... Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is, it depends on the quality of the object, the quality of the model you want and the facility in which you have to do it. But I mean, people do that all the time. They'll do whole buildings or, or pieces of architecture or you know, archaeologists use it to document work sites. Um, um, there's a lot of work that is done to preserve um, artifacts that live in nature that are in danger. So, you know, large scale statues um, and sculptures and pieces of architecture as a way of, of sort of capturing those things. So you really, with, and that's particular to, I think to photogrammetry really. I mean, um, if you were scanning with a laser, that would be, you'd, you'd, I think maybe you'd have different limitations, but I shouldn't say that. I don't know as much about that. But um, with photogrammetry, it's really um, about uh, how much you can capture with a, with a photograph and um, your access to the object. So. Size is not, not quite as important. Okay. So um, now let's talk about a few ways we can incorporate this with our families or our friends. Um, you mentioned university classes is, is a great one. Um, compare and contrast. You could also, um, I know Kelly uh, last December, she subbed a virtual art adventures class for us and, and used clay um, and we made um, pinch pots. So perhaps there is a clay based kind of sculpting activity uh, with some of these ritual vessels or the cute ducks. Um, so the, there's definitely a lot of possibilities for ways to incorporate this beyond just using our eyes. Uh, perhaps if you were, you know, drawing in Klein, you could sketch some of the patterns that you might notice on these objects once you're able to get up really close. So we're definitely exploring ways, like you've mentioned, both education, conservation, curatorially, um, to figure out how to better incorporate these and use them more as we, you know, seek out people to learn more about our collection. So that's great. Um, let's see. If we had any last minute questions, ooh, here we go. Violet's question was, what is the duck doing? So let's oh, pop yeah. back to Sketchfab. That's a good eyes. Right, so that duck is, uh, it's two ducks together. They're, a, they're actually a vessel. <laughs> My internet's a little slow, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if you can flip it so you can see the top, you can see that there's a hole. Sorry, you're still loading. Um, Oops, that was the bottom. I, I, I was trying to follow directions. <laughs> okay. So there's, you know, there's a hole there, and, and you would use that hole to fill, fill the vessel with water. And then you can see that one of the duck's heads uh, has an open bill and <laughs> you would pour the water out uh, as a dropper through that bill. But I, I'm not going to, I can't set, tell you any more about it than, than that. Um, but one thing that if you want to flip it over again, that was kind of interesting um, is that you'll see that there is a, a couple of numbers on the bottom there. Um, yeah, we got 15 of, and something else. Yeah, and I don't know what the 15 is. That probably is a mark that was put on there before it came to the Ackland. But the, the number is, um, that's going to be an accession number for the museum. It looks like we would have bought this or acquired it in some way in 1991. And um, so when they put, uh, we don't, we don't uh, it looks like it's right on the object. And in fact, we, didn't, we don't write right on objects. Um, the registrar or conservator would put down a material, a, a, a type of a paint that uh, is non-reactive to the surface of the object first, and then they would write onto that. And then at any point you can, it's, it's totally undoable. You can take a solvent and it, it will, uh, has no adverse effects to the material and then you can remove it. We don't do that with all objects, but certain of mm -hmm. them it's okay to do with. No, that's, that's great. Um, and so with these accession numbers prior to computers, was that how 
do you know how like registrars kept track of things? Was yeah, well, that still again? is. It's it's still the way that we continue to to um, uh, to keep track of objects in the collection. But yeah, we have um, we have a whole room of filing cabinets, um, and they're, they're all you know all, all the files have those are, have those numbers. On them, and that's that's how we continue to to look up objects within the collection, whether it's on the computer or in those filing cabinets.